Hello, friends. Imagine two young Jewish friends are walking along the seashore of Lake Galilee in the days of Christ. And they look up and they see Jesus coming. And one says to the other, you know, I have come to believe that this man is God. The other is aghast and speaks sharply to his friend, be quiet, quit blaspheming. If anyone hears you, you'll be stoned to death. And if I were the man I should be, I'd stone you myself. This illustrates the original scandal of what we very commonly assume to be the basic tenet of the Christian faith, that Jesus is God in the flesh. In his incarnation, he deigned to come among us, to be God in our midst. And this was repugnant to the Jews, who would not picture God in any way, nor would they talk to him in a familiar manner. The idea that God was anything other than transcendent was unthinkable. And Jesus was finally put to death because he continually scandalized the Jews, who in the end decided he was too much of a risk. His final crime was that he claimed sonship with God and the kingship of the Jews. The marriage of the Godhead with mankind is the new covenant, the one that was to include not simply Jews, but all the world. It is the new wine, the new covenant in his blood that he spoke about. He was the Paschal Lamb that must be slaughtered and consumed that the angel of death might pass over the one covered by his blood. We speak of his suffering and death often and just as often miss the point of his death. Brutalization, death, even resurrection is not the end. Communion is the end, the banquet, the communion, the eating of the one loaf that makes us all brothers and sisters in the same Lord, the Passover lamb had to be killed, but it also had to be eaten. How was this to be accomplished? More scandal. In the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus makes direct reference to the necessity of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Four times in seven verses, those who heard him were shocked they believed him to be referring to the unthinkable act of cannibalism. Far from backing off, softening his stand, and telling them that he was using an analogy, he continued to antagonize them on this point. He would naturally have had uh, the moral responsibility to make this clear if they misunderstood him, but they didn't. The Jews were not permitted to consume blood. And the act of cannibalism was abhorrent. Most of his disciples left him in disgust. He did not call after them, even though their salvation hung in the balance. He asked his apostles if they would like to leave too. I imagine they would have liked to if they had anywhere else to go, but they decided to trust this scandal in the light of the Jesus that they had come to know. <clears throat> Later it came more clear as Jesus played out the Passover in his own person. He held out the bread and the wine and told them to take and eat. This was his body and his blood. Really? 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 expanded on this belief and give us some perspective on how the original friends of Jesus understood this sacrament. The historic church has always held this scandalous notion out to the world for the salvation of all. It continues the scandal of God's condescension in every age and calls us to his family. We are members by blood, not just in spirit. It is confounding to me that many Christians will enthusiastically embrace the Incarnation, and recoil at the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharistic species. Why swallow the camel of the Incarnation and strain at the gnat of transubstantiation? Which mystery is more unlikely? 
There have been some efforts in Christendom to soften this scandal, to make it more palatable to the enlightened world. Protestant reformers proposed the idea of consubstantiation. This means that the bread and the wine change in essence only. They are at one and the same time bread and wine and the body and blood of Christ. However, the substance, bread and wine, remains the same. Also, some Christians say that communion is only a memorial representation. Some denominations will speak of the real presence, but always they mean something short of transubstantiation. Only Catholics and Orthodox teach that the bread and the wine are no longer bread and wine, but are the whole and entire body, <clears throat> blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. He is there in his total person, which only appears as bread and wine, but are entirely changed in substance and in essence. Hear me well. To insist on this uncomfortable reality is dangerous. The critics of Catholicism are right to see this critical distinction in our church. If we are right on this, then we're truly right. If, on the other hand, we command the worship of what is only bread, then we are Satan's instrument. I hope that during this year of trying to appreciate and understand the holy mystery, that you'll visit Jesus often in the tabernacle and learn to appreciate your exalted position and to share in his body and blood. Many blessings to all of you today.